Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'll do a little bit of the sort of bio resume kind of thing. Uh, grew up in East Lansing, small family. Grew up in a Catholic home uh, with a sense of uh, responsibility and duty, you know, rules about going to church and those kind of things. Uh, very beneficial. Good family, good parents. Uh, went to school, went to MSU, uh, didn't particularly have a plan, uh, kind of bumped and bumped, and then uh, ended up getting, uh, while I was finishing a master's degree, because the bachelor's degree wasn't working, so then I went back for a master's degree. Uh, while I was finishing that, I got a job with the state in the uh, Department of Social Services, so the welfare agency. And this is great, I got a job and I can finish my degree and then I can go out and get you know, wherever my career is gonna take me. I uh, ended up lasting for seven years in the Department of Social Services and the reason was because I worked with such good people and we were doing important work and it was really much more interesting than I expected. Ended up then working in economic development in the state, then I ended up working in budget in the state. So I've gone from sort of uh, entry level in a cubicle in a state office building to the point where I'm essentially the senior civil servant, permanent government type of state government in Michigan. And that went on over 15 years or so, 20 years. Uh, and then Governor Engler, who I had not, I didn't know him when he ran for office, but uh, he asked me to go on the, the political side, so I was now the budget director and ultimately his education advisor and things like that. So. A uh, long time working in state government, and not because I had a plan. Uh, then uh, went to Michigan State University and had uh, everything that is not academics reporting to me. So the police department, all the finances, the grounds and maintenance, the dorms, uh, Big Ten athletics, uh, and had that, and that wasn't particularly a great fit, and ended up working back with the governor, then came to Grand Valley State University, which is 2001, and I came, we moved here 15 years ago, and I came here to be president of Grand Valley State University, uh, and had uh, so grateful, extraordinary opportunity, great school, uh, and within a couple of years of that, the Meyer family asked me to come and serve on the board. Uh, and then ultimately they asked me to come in and run the company. I uh, did that for about seven years, last couple years. I'm now called the vice chairman of the company, uh, so I don't run the company day to day. There's somebody else doing that, but I'm still helping the Meyer family, helping the company. So that's sort of the short run, and the, you know, the punchline would be there was no plan whatsoever. Uh, it was simply doors kept opening as I was uh, doing what the best I could at what I was do charged with for that particular day. Uh, and I, I'll give you a couple of sort of overarching lessons that I feel like I took from that uh, body of work. And, uh, and again, I'm going to keep this pretty short because I'm really going to be most helpful if you ask me, you know, questions or thoughts or concerns or, you know, how, to, you know, how do you actually live a faith life? And I'll talk a little bit about it, but I, I'll keep this pretty short. One of them... Uh, and, and actually, I'm going to go, let me start a different place before I do the lessons. There are two, I'm a reader. Uh, there's two books that have been kind of fundamental to me as I have figured out how to lead. Uh, one of them is Leadership as an Art, Max Dupree. Uh, it's kind of a, just a classic. It's a classic West Michigan. Uh, if you took a, a fundamental summary of it, uh, it is one of the early books on what gets called servant leadership. Uh, everywhere you are. My, my parents taught us to keep our heads up a little bit higher, look out at a little bit more distant horizon, and our parents also taught us to keep our arms out a little bit and, and include some other people. And that's kind of, Max Dupree's got a different version of that story, but it's basically to say there are people around you you can serve. Now if you're going to be in business, most of you are in business, you've got to be serving somebody. Uh, when I was working for the welfare agency, uh, one of the reasons why I was maybe a little bit more effective and got asked to do a little bit more was because I was always thinking not about, you know, us in our cubicles and what do we need today and, you know, sort of like the office, uh, but I was thinking about what, what are we really doing here for the welfare recipients? What are we doing to help people lift people out of poverty? Those kind of, so keep in your eye, what is the ultimate purpose here? And so this, this leadership as an art keeps you on servant leadership serving the people you work with, serving your customers, really serving them. 
Not pretending like you're serving them, but really serving them. Uh, the second book uh, that was instrumental in me, uh, and it's not a West Michigan, so this is, this is kind of Harvard Business School kind of thing, is Leadership Without Easy Answers uh, by a guy named Ron Heifetz. And one of the things in that book uh, that's so fundamental, and I've worked in big organizations, so I'm, I'm pretty good at big organizations. I big government, big higher ed, big business, we have 70,000 employees at Meyer. I, I get how big business works and how it doesn't work. Uh, but in that big, one of the most important things after you get done figuring out what it is that you have to do, what's the new strategic initiative and how are you gonna resource it and how are you gonna let people do their jobs, the last part of it is listen to the voices of dissent. Why do you listen to the voices of dissent? Because you never get it right. There's always somebody out there who knows that you, whatever's cascading down from the top, there's something isn't quite working there. And if you're not spending time listening and serving your own organization, you're not ultimately going to end up being able to keep tuning and keep making things better. So that's kind of a little bit of, and I'm, I'm sticking right now mostly with work. These are the sort of the work things. Um, but a couple lessons out of this. One, I uh, had a friend early on who talked about boss identification. He was very skilled at boss identification. I became skilled at boss identification. Now, why is that? Is that so that you can sort of be a toady and do whatever it is that you, you, know, you suck up you know, that the boss? There's a different version of it, which is there really is legitimate authority in organizations. It's sort of chaotic if you don't have legitimate structures and what does that boss? What does that boss really need? What, what's the? What are they really trying to accomplish? And how do I help that person accomplish this on behalf of the organization? And then, when are they about to make a mistake? I took some fairly significant career risks over time by essentially figuring out how to tell the boss that they did. You know, emperor had no clothes, or they were about to do something. And those are risky moves, but they're not, they're, they're essential. I mean, if you're really gonna be serving the purpose and two things that, and it's isn't like we were doing this every week, but you know, a couple times a year, I find myself asking for a little bit of time and wander in and better be prepared. You, be, you know, better be right. And you better be modest about it. You're really there to help the person. You're about to walk off a cliff and I just wanna, before we do this, I just want to say, you know, now there have actually been a couple places, and I learned this from my dad, a couple places where I had to be prepared to quit. Because, I, you know, if the, if the cliff is an unethical cliff, then, then we're going to have to part ways. Now, hopefully we can figure out a way to steer this thing back to doing what's right. Most people, most organizations want to do what's right. But that boss identification and really serving the person for whom you're working with legitimate authority is very important. We talked about the real customers, the, the heads up, arms out, keep a broader sense. Uh, there is no substitute for work. This is probably the most fundamental problem that most of us have, which is how to balance work and all the other things we're responsible for. You really are responsible for your children. You really are responsible for your spouse. You really are responsible in your community. You're responsible in your church. You're responsible. You know, where, wherever you're volunteering, you're, you, you, you have these broader responsibilities, and the nature of the economic system right now wants to just consume every single thing you've got and put it into work. Uh, I do not, I, I, you know, the, the old line is you're gonna, nobody sits in the nursing home wishing they spent more time at work. Uh, fundamentally true, if I had a, you know, what did I blow along the way? Uh, my children suffered uh, in some cases because of bad decisions I made about sticking with work too much. Having said that and recognizing it, and I've talked to them about it, doesn't mean that you don't have to still be all in in what it is that you're called to do. These are, these are vocations, they're callings, they're not just jobs. And, and how, do you, how do you stay focused on that and really put the time in? Couple other basic lessons from the work, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about spiritual works and, uh, and roots and, uh, and the intersection. Uh, one is uh, I found over time 
there's a there's a and again I'm I'm a large organization guy. I'm not a I'm not an entrepreneur running my own thing. I'm in this context of a lot of people. Uh, the phrasing came from a guy in Detroit, uh, Bill Beckham, uh, who ran the Skillman Foundation. Fabulous human being, died too young. Uh, and it was make the right decision and then make the decision right. You're going to make all kinds of decisions and you're going to have limited information. You're going to decide to marry somebody. You're going to decide to take the job. You're going to decide to buy the house. You're going to decide maybe a simple thing is what your vacation is. Make the decision. Once you make that decision, make that decision right. You make the right decision, make the decision right. Now it's time, and you know, there's, there's a little bit of analysis, you know, why did I decide this, and you can learn some things. But an awful lot of people don't actually put their hand to the plow. They spend their time looking backwards all the time and second guessing, and, and geez, maybe, you know, maybe, boy, well, this is how marriages fall apart. This is how people don't actually engage their employment as well as they could. This is how nonprofits don't thrive and flourish as much as they could because people keep second guessing what they're doing instead of putting that intense energy into now making the decision right. This is what we decided to do, let's go make it perfect. Entrepreneurs know this. Entrepreneurs know that when they make the decision to start up a business, they don't always get it right. They almost never get it all right. They've got to go dig in and keep making it right. You got to keep, that's the instinct and that's the thing to be applied in every, every area, every domain of your life. And again, something that I, I'm now somebody who turned out to be pretty successful I look back and say, well, why, you know, what, what was it that people saw in me that allowed me to ask, they would open a door and say, would you come and help us with this? Because I was always there committed to trying to make whatever it is we're doing, let's make this as right as we can possibly make it. Um, this probably a little bit of a bridge into the questions of faith, uh, which is I found over time there's some pretty basic things uh, like fairness or justice and like courage uh, that are pretty darn important. Uh, I can remember uh, in early work days, it was not uncommon to have some pretty demeaning kind of standard joke stuff going on about women and minorities. Uh, and somebody's got to step into that. Now the natural reaction when somebody's doing something inappropriate is to kind of step back and say, well, geez, you know, I hope, I hope that stops or, you know, I hope, I hope the boss intervenes on this or, well, it just, that's kind of, that's the natural reaction. There's a different reaction, which is to go ahead and be the person that steps in. Now, this is not a, you know, it's not the, the biggest thing in the world, but somebody's got to step in and say, well, geez, let's, uh, can, can we, you know, can, how about those tigers? You know, can we just change the subject here? Can we, can we say something private to somebody and just say, boy, you know, Scott's feeling pretty uncomfortable about that. You know, could we, you know, we love Scott. Let's just, can we turn that down a little bit? This isn't high, high ground. This isn't moral. This, but this is a fundamental, it is moral, but it's a fundamental question about who's going to step in and who's gonna step back. And that takes a little bit of courage. What you're gonna find, what I found, because this isn't a natural act, what, what I found was it's actually good. We can do this. And then you begin to have and you, and a little bit, well, what, what the great thinkers talk about with virtue is that virtues are actually habits. These aren't binary, there's not you're courageous, you're not courageous. Courage is, a, is something that we, we build up as habits. Fairness is something we build up as habits. These are classic, classic, classic virtues. They find them in the scripture, and you find them in any kind of standard philosophical work, because in fact, when we're fair with each other, when we're just, when we're courageous, when we're modest, humble, all those kind of things, it actually works out real well in organizations. Again, I'm a big, big organization person. What have we been doing? Big organizations have been stripping out middle management. You don't have as many checkers checking the checkers as you used to have, so there's more autonomy in the organization. Most organizations now are focusing on their core business. 
So they're not doing all these other things they used to do. They're working on the thing they do, and they've got all these outside business partnerships with other people that do. Well, if you've got a bunch of, if the new, the new world is, there's a bunch of new outside business partners, and oh, by the way, we've got more people with more autonomy inside of an organization, and oh, by the way, we have to compete ever faster. If you don't have a world where your word is actually good, and people are prepared to keep pushing through change, if you don't have it, you can't compete. So these are actually really important competitive advantages, these old fundamental virtues. They actually make you more competitive and more able to work in the, in the, in the current market economy. But the virtues also speak to who you are as a person and how you as a person are gonna engage. And here I'll make a little bit of the bridge over into the question of faith. I, uh, working in government, uh, never wore my faith on my sleeve and I never denied it. I was not one who was, well, actually, I, you know, occasionally in my cubicle, I'd have a little, uh, you know, grounding card that would remind me, you know, where, where True North is. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wasn't, a, 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 and I'm still not. Uh, I'm not preaching. I, work, I work, worked in a public university, worked in two different public universities. It's a big and complicated world. And there's people of all kinds of different beliefs, and we really fundamentally have responsibility to work with each other and respect each other and respect people of different faiths and 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 if asked, happy to talk about, but I didn't I didn't heavily wear it on my sleeve. But I can tell you um, there is one part of the Christian scripture that has been true north for me for my entire life, and I'm not sure I understood it until a little bit later. And it was back to I'm so grateful for the family I was raised in because I now look back and I could see that it was in their behaviors and it was in their words that they led me to this. And, and this was the thing I would ask you to consider. Uh, at some point, open it up in the 25th chapter of Matthew. One chapter, the 25th chapter of Matthew. And let me tell you, I'll give you a little context and I'll tell you what you're gonna find there, but I'd ask you to take a little time and not just read it, but read it and reflect on a little bit. So here's the context. The context is uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke basically tell a bunch of stories about Jesus, uh, and John's a little bit different as a gospel. So Matthew's telling all these stories about Jesus, and there's the Sermon on the Mount, and, you know, blessed are the poor, and there's, all, and there's miracles, and there's teachings and there's people who are falling away and there's all kinds of people following him and not following him and et cetera, et cetera. There's all these stories. Chapter 25. Chapter 26 begins the process by which he will be tortured, crucified, and rise from the dead. So chapter 26 is now the end of the teaching and we're going into what is torture, death, resurrection. So what's the last thing said in the teachings? Chapter 25. It's basically couldn't, you know, sort of let's, let's, let's summarize all this now. And there's three parts of that. Two of them are what are called parables, basically stories. And one of them is a little bit more directive. First story is a person getting ready for a wedding. And there are people, bridesmaids, waiting and the, and the, bride, and the groom is late. And some of them have got oil and some of them don't have oil. And right at the end, he shows up, and some of them have got their lamps lit, and some of them don't have their lamps lit. And we go with the people that have their lamps lit, other people are out trying to get some oil, door shuts, and the, as the knocking on the door goes, the answer is, I don't actually know who you are, to the people who didn't have their oil, who weren't prepared. The punchline I always took out of that was, be prepared. This is like serious, We're, you know, be prepared at work. Be prepared in your family. Be prepared for the fact that your children are gonna challenge you. Be prepared for the fact that somebody's gonna be in need when you walk down the street. Be prepared. And there's a certain urgency to this. Not good consequences if you're not being serious about this. Be sober and vigilant, says uh, Peter, in either first or second Peter. Second one is a story. A guy goes away and goes on a journey and he hands his servants money. So he hands one of them 
5,000, hands another one 2,000, another one 1,000, says, hey, I'll be back. The one with 5,000, by the time he comes back, he's got 10,000, he's multiplied it. Uh, somebody gives him 2,000, he comes back, he's got 4,000. The guy with 1,000 says, well, geez, this is a tough guy. I'm gonna bury this money. And when the tough guy comes back, at least I'm gonna be able to give him back his money. It's called the parable of the talents. Good and faithful servant, five turned into 10. Good and faithful servant, two turned into four. Guy with a thousand, hey, you know, I know you're a tough guy. I'm giving you back your thousand. Oh, not good, not good. What an unfaithful servant. Off into the wailing and the gnashing of the teeth. From the beginning, and I realize it now, but from the beginning, I had a sense, God's given me a bunch of talents and I better use them. I need to use them. I need to use them. And the beautiful part of that story, which I didn't understand until much later, was 5,000 made another 5,000. The 5,000 didn't exist at the beginning. If you use your talents, if you push yourself, if you try and figure out how to serve your family better, you serve your workplace better, serve your community better, it's gonna, you're gonna end up with skills you didn't have. I was not comfortable and I was not capable of me having a talk like this at a certain point in my professional life. But I had to, and I had to learn it, and I had to push myself. And I ended up with talents that I didn't previously have because God's faithful and, and that's how we were created and that's how the world actually works and this is good. The last one is, so what are you gonna use these talents for? And this one isn't actually a story. A Little bit of a story. But it's basically, it's the only place in scripture where there is a statement of what's the final judgment. Sitting on the throne. Scott. You fed me when I was hungry. You clothed me when I was naked. Come on in. When, when did that happen? When you did it to the least. That's why I love this Mel Trotter project. When you did it to the least of them, you did it for me. Claire, I was in prison and you didn't come and visit me. I was hungry and you didn't feed me. Not a good outcome, not a good outcome. I'm gonna circle all the way back, and this isn't just, it is the least among us, <clears throat> but it isn't just the least among us. I'm going all the way back to Max Dupree and leadership as an art. It's about serving other people. It's about serving what, what's going on right now and trying to raise up kids in an educational setting it doesn't say, I was ignorant and you taught me. That's not one of the tests in that. I believe it is part of the general sense that you're doing these things. Why are you developing all these talents? You're doing them for somebody else. You're doing them for others. And you will end up, I have ended up more and more fulfilled because of that. And I seek to be in a position where I can give a faithful answer. Uh, when, when, when the time has come to have answers. So that's a little bit of me, and I, I, I'm, I'm grateful that I was able to uh, carry on, do interesting professional work. Uh, I got a bunch of, you know, a bunch of stories about working with the legislature and getting bills passed and school finance and Nick Saban and, you know, all kinds of stuff, but I, the, uh, the fundamentals I just wanted to lay out is that there's, uh, it, it, it my, mine was no plan. I, I didn't, I don't have a, I'm, I'm running a, I ran, I'm not doing it right now, I ran a very big business and I didn't particularly, I, I wasn't a business person. I ran the treasury of Michigan and I'm not an accountant. I ran the welfare agency for a while, I'm not a social worker. I ran the university, I'm not a PhD. And I am very grateful that I was given these opportunities, but I also know I earned those opportunities. I, I didn't have the credentials, but I earned them because whatever I was doing at the time, I was all in. And I was doing what I was doing as well as I could possibly do it, and I was doing it for the 
for the good and the effect of both the organization and the people and the organization and the people being served by the organization. And then the next door opened. And if the next door hadn't opened, if I were still working for the state, I'd be fine. If I was still working for Michigan State, I'd be fine. If I was still working in Grand Valley, I'd be happy as could be. So it's not, it wasn't that, it wasn't a tactical decision. I need to do this so that, you know, so I can get out of here and get some other door open. I need to do this because here's where I am. And I need to do this as well as I can possibly do it. So with that, I think I'm gonna, let me just do one quick check here on a couple pieces of paper. See if there's anything else I wanna say. And then I'm gonna just say, who's got some questions or comments? Do I have a mission statement about what I'm here to do? I, uh, the fact that I can't give it to you right now says probably not. Uh, uh, I, uh, I, I'd say I've got a, uh, my, my day, I get up early and my day does begin in prayer. And, and in prayer it is a little bit of sort of cosmic, you know, I mean I'm, I'm so, I try to be grateful for the extraordinary gifts and creation and all those kind of things and, and gratitude's real important and try to refocus. And then I do think about the day and the week. And what, I mean, I, this morning, what, what can I do here today to be helpful here? What, I don't need to be here, you know, I, but what can I do to be helpful? What can I, I've got some other things going on today. What can I do to actually be helpful? And so I, so, so maybe if I were to make it, it's a little bit of, and, and it's particularly, I'm in my 63rd year now, you know, I mean, I'm in a different spot. There was a time when what was absolutely, how on earth do I balance this, all these demands at work and helping these kids of mine that are in middle school and all the challenges they're facing. And so it's different phases, different points in your life. But right now, it's so much about what can I be usefully doing in the circumstances that I find myself in. I have... Uh, because of the roles I'm in, I have a fair amount of power and, and authority kind of things, and I've got to be using those for, for good. So, so that's probably is, what can I do today to make a difference for somebody, you know, around me? Maybe that would be the simplest one. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm always uh, reluctant to talk about anybody else's faith. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a, there's, there's a little bit of a privacy element, and there's also a little bit of, I, you know, I, I don't know, it, I don't know anybody's heart very well. Uh, you know, sometimes I'm not sure I know my own heart all that well. I, you know, we're all a bag of tricks, and, you know, we, we think we're doing this for altruistic reasons, and then we turn around and realize, we look in the mirror, we realize we're just being kind of selfish at that point. So I, I, I'm pretty careful about this, but I will tell you, uh, they are, uh, there are three brothers, uh, Hank, Doug, and Mark. Uh, Fred passed away now probably three or four years ago. Uh, Fred was a, just an extraordinary, classic entrepreneur. Uh, the three brothers are really, really good people. They are the kind of people who will not uh, you know, walk past the, the problem. They are people who who have a servant's heart. They're, they're good, good people. Uh, their faith life, there seems to be uh, active church going and things like that in, in this next generation. But I, again, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna venture too far into all that. Cause, uh, but I, they're, and because and, and it matters, because we're all living here in West Michigan, uh, they are 100% committed to keeping us a privately held family company for, for decades to come as far as the eye can see 
which is really good. When, I, when they asked me to come on the board, that was the question I asked them. We just had, uh, within a year before, we'd had Fifth Third buy up Old Kent. And I said, I'm not, I'm not here to make a moral judgment about whether you should sell your company or not. I'm just telling you, I can't, I'm president of Grand Valley State University, I can't be on your board when you sell. It's just not good for the university or for, for you know, okay. And that, that's when they described <clears throat> why it was they had, you know, they, why they, they could avoid selling at Fred's passing because they'd done all the work they needed to do and they had no interest in selling. And that's still true to this day, so. <clears throat> We started out with a technology little air, air horn. The air horn. <laughs> what would be your reflections from all your experience about the uh, wonderful advantages and future of technology as it affects not just Meyer but culture? And what would be your reflections on watchouts or, or concerns? I, the, uh, the, the woman, the young woman or woman portrayed in that with, you know, this, <clears throat> the term I use for this is isopath. That's psychopath, isopath. I'm on my own, isolated. This is so darn dangerous. There are isopaths everywhere. I'm an isopath sometimes. I'm, I'm busy checking my my world, my email, my text, my, I'm not in all the social media. That would, I mean, it'd be even worse. This is a very isolating thing. Uh, so I, and, and I don't, you know, the, the, I'm, the politics we've got going right now, that's got so much anger and division in it, we're getting deeper and deeper into our little tribes, into our worlds. And this is not good. This is really dangerous. Now, it's, of course, it's a powerful tool. We're able to get you, you know, coupons at Meyer, and I can look stuff up now that I couldn't possibly have understood before, and I can be in cut contact with my kids instantaneously. I mean, there's so, so much good here. <clears throat> so, you know, nuclear power versus nuclear weapons. I mean, you know, there's enormous good and there's enormous challenge. And don't underestimate how uh, isolated we can become and how, how deeply, it's so easy now to only talk to people or only read things that confirm what it is you believe or people just like you. We're getting we're at real risk here of isolating and fracturing ourselves into little sub-tribes. And it's not good for our communities, it's not good for us as individuals, it doesn't push us outside our boundaries, it doesn't get us into empathy and understanding of others. So. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm both a, I'm a perpetrator and a victim uh, of this thing on its bad side, and there's, uh, there's, wonderful, there's wonderful, wonderful good, which is the obvious stuff. That's why we're all drawn to it. That's why we're all spending our time checking things, because it's, it's utilitarian, it's incredibly helpful, and it, in some sides, it actually increases our social connectivity. It makes us m more able to communicate. We, Scott and I were texting back and forth about this meeting, and I was so glad to know he was coming. But it, you know, it's couldn't have done it. Wouldn't wouldn't have done that in previous previous years. So well, that's a little bit of that. Yeah, Mark, okay. I have a question. Just you talked about not wearing your face on the, your sleeve as yeah. a person at a big organization. Um, have you seen your own willingness to share your faith change as you've gone through your career? Can you speak to that? And is there a point where, uh, as we as believers become Yeah. Uh, because, because, you know, as yeah, we know in the yeah. scripture, it says, you who deny me before men, I'll deny before my Father in heaven. Yeah. So yeah. It seems like that's always kind of a tension in the workplace. Yeah. Like, am I actually not being genuine when I'm not open and not wearing my face on my sleeve? Can you speak to that? Because yeah, that's a great question. And I, I, I could give you kind of a noble version of the answer, which is, you know, I'm more mature and all those kind of things. There's also a, an, a, an unnoble or not noble or whatever the opposite of noble is version of it, which is a little bit of fear. Uh, and fear combined with a little bit of sort of tactical judgment. Um, I, you know, I worked in government. Uh, in government, there, in, particularly in some of the administrations I was working in, there's a fair amount of hostility to religion. 
Uh, I remember uh, I was being offered a position uh, and I just said, because I knew it was a little bit related, I said, I just want you to know before we sign up for all this stuff, because I was going to be representing this particular group in front of the legislature on some stuff, I said, you just need to know I'm getting a little bit more active in Michigan Right to Life. Didn't get the job. Uh, didn't really have anything to do with it, but we, we sort of can't tolerate that. Now, I don't say that as a condemnation of them. I mean, I understand what, you know, what optics they were trying to organize around, and, and this is a little bit of a, a, you know, a little bit of sand in the gears if we have this person over here doing this kind of thing. But it was a disappointment, but I, you know, I learned a little bit of a lesson. Um, had another situation, same kind of thing. Uh, that, that is, in governmental circles in the worlds I was in, which was healthcare and finance kind of things, the questions of funding abortion was a big political issue, and it continues to this day. Uh, a different circumstance, I was in front of somebody, and would you come over and do this? And I said, so, by the way, I'm you know, happy to do the work. You just need to know I'm not going to go lobby the legislature, which I would have to be doing this job, for Medicaid funding of abortions. Oh, that's fine. So-and-so will do it. Well, so-and-so had never been asked that question before, and so-and-so said, no, actually, I won't do it either. So, so you know, you, there, there, are times, there are times when you have to say, these are lines I will not cross, and you deal with the consequences of it. The, the lines actually matter. Um, in terms of uh, the sharing, when you, you see somebody hurting or you see somebody a little lost and bewildered, and you know that if you could just help a little bit there. Mine was more on the sort of practical, secular kind of stuff than, than any kind of spiritual offerings. And a little bit of it was tactical. It, it, it just, you know, I, if, if, if you go too far down that road, you, you, you get isolated organizationally. And, and there's a little bit of that that's honest, fair analysis, and a little bit of it's probably fear. Uh, now, I'm, you know, I'm immortal. I mean, I don't you know, I don't, I don't need a job, I don't, you know, there's nobody, I'm untouchable, maybe is a better way to say it. I mean, I, you know, really, I mean, you know, I, who cares? I don't, so, so I, have no, I have no fear. I'm still pretty circumspect about it because I don't, I, I really believe very strongly that, that it's an it's a awfully messy and complicated world that we're in, and I want to try it very slowly in terms of, uh, Sort of pushing people into some corner and wanting to know why they're, you know, you know, don't don't you understand? You know, God died for you. You know, I mean, can you? What are you doing here? And and it's just maybe I'm wrong. You know, I but but I don't. I, I'm pretty careful. But I, uh, I certainly that particular scripture has run through my mind over the many years, which is I also have a responsibility to be a faithful witness. I mean, what's going on right now in the Middle East, what went on and, you know, and, and other things. I mean, you've got, you got people who are being asked today, you know, are you on this team or are you on that team? And if the answer is you're on that team, then we're going to cut your head off. And, you know, the martyrs continue to be martyred. And this has been the, the seed of the church from the beginning. And it's very real. This is not a cartoon. This is, these are real brothers and sisters. So I, I'm that's, but that's, that's been my experience. Mike Shea, Mark, about your prayer time. Woman, or how do you? Yeah, it's, prayer is, I'm, I'm still actively, happily, devoutly a Catholic, and we have a, a, a regular lectionary, so it's easy to have sort of the readings of the day as a way to stay focused in Scripture, and that's sort of the core of it. I have found over recent years the Psalms, are extraordinarily powerful. Uh, you know the 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 opening the opening of so so Psalms are 150 of them and, and David purported to be the author, but maybe a bunch of people about just sort of deep basic. You know who am I? God, you know protect me. The you know the the, the world's in chaos around me kind of stuff. Uh, very, very powerful things, and they they open with. Uh, Happy the man who follows not the counsel of the wicked, uh, uh, sits in the company of the insolent, uh, scoffers, depends on the translation, but meditates on the law of God day and night. 
that's the beginning of the Psalms. The last thing in the Psalms is let everything that is life and breath give praise. I mean, it's, what, what could be more basic than that? Let us, let us be with people who will uplift us, let us focus on the Word of God, and let us be grateful, grateful, grateful for what's around us. Uh, so those are some of the things. There's a, there's a very, there's a formula from when I was probably in my 20s when I kind of renewed my, my personal commitment, uh, which is ACTS, ACTS, Adoration, Contrition, Thanksgiving, Supplication. It, just recognizing God is God. God. God's our creator. We're schleps, you know. We, there is a, you know, what, what, what's my, what are my failings now and when? And just bring them. Just, you know, I'm. This, this is my problem, you know, and, and it may be. I'm not even going to name them. I mean, you, you, you got problems. I got problems. I'm, we're failing. We're not, we're not following God. Thanksgiving, that's the one I find most powerful. That's, gratitude is, a, is an absolute, wonderful, powerful, you know, nurturer of the good. And a supplication. I, I pray a lot for other people. I, I pray for my family. I pray for friends. I've got network people who are sick. I spend a lot of time in prayer for others. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the deal. Yeah. 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 That's great. So, how do you how do you how do you ensure that you should actually go through that door? Uh, in retrospect, now uh, I would say I see, looking backwards, the hand of God in wonderful ways. And I I want to be very careful. I never heard the voice of God saying, you know, door A. Uh, and I, but I, I, I walked away from two or three jobs that were absolutely the obvious thing to do, except I'd be in prayer and they weren't the obvious thing to do. And, and now I look back and I, 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 would be, I wouldn't be able to be living in Grand Rapids and my family might not be as strong and stable as it is and there's just some, some stuff. And, and I look back and I'm very grateful. And, but I, I never made from the time that Elizabeth and I decided to be married to uh, job things to where we're going to live, uh, I never made decisions without spending some time in prayer. And again, I don't, I don't want to be, you know, I don't, you know, open up the Bible and there it is, you know, move to Hamden Drive. It just it, uh, <laughs> may work for others, never worked for me that way. And I, and I, I hope for it a couple times because it's, it's kind of lot, you get lost and bewildered and you're not sure whether you should be doing this or doing that. Um, and, and particularly to me, the, the, the thing that just pulls your heart is, are you doing the right thing for your kids? And, and those, are, those are some very hard decisions sometimes. Um, and, and for those of you who don't have kids, have kids. It's, it's the greatest thing there is in the world. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And talk about drawing yourself out and becoming better people and learning new talents. Yeah. Yeah, and I know uh, we're expecting our first kid next month. Excellent. You mentioned uh, that, you know, one of the things that you can learn in your career is how to be all in in your career, but also yeah. marriage and your family. Yeah. Kids. Yeah. Um, you know, what suggestions do you have for someone in my shoes just kind of getting started now? Because when you learn, like, where do you kind of draw the boundary line between kind of work and family? A couple things. One, one is uh, many work environments are getting better now at recognizing that. And so at some level, if you have the choice, and we don't always have the choice, if you have the choice, get to a better work environment, a place that will respect the fact that, that you might have to leave a little bit early to go catch something or give somebody a ride or, you know, sick kid or all those kind of things. And, and you know, sometimes it's, it's the evil ogre boss. A lot of times it's the nature of the organization. I, we can't let you go. You know, this work, we, do, we just don't have that flexibility. It's all, it's all we'd love to, but we can't. But if you can, if you have it, if you have you know door A, door B, get to a place. If you're going to raise a family, get to a place where you got a little bit more flexibility. Within the decision, you're just going to have to uh, temper yourself because if you've got a drive to make a difference in your workplace with the people you're working with, to advance a career so that you can have 
the resources to, to really have a strong family and really test yourself and use the talents God gave you and you're pushing yourself, you're just gonna, you're gonna have to have some, some self-discipline on that. Uh, one of the one lessons I didn't cover in here is, uh, you know, we can divide the world into lots of ways, two groups, you know, the rich and the poor and the educated and the uneducated and the this and the that and the Republicans and the Democrats, you know, we like to divide the world. I, one of the ways I divide the world in two places, the deferred gratification team and the immediate gratification team. The immediate gratification team is the one that you see present in most media at all times. The deferred gratification team is the one that you don't see in the media because they're busy working all day and they're busy at home raising their family. Be on the deferred gratification team. The deferred gratification team wins. The immediate gratification team typically loses. This is one of the lessons of the Psalms. But the deferred gratification team, you're, you're actually going to have a lot of nights where you should be getting you know, seven hours of sleep and you're getting four. You, you, there's going to be some deferred gratification going on here. And, and it's, it's great. It's wonderful. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, but, but in that reflection, it may be deferred gratification at work because you, you just can't, you can't accept this promotion that somebody's about to offer you because it really is all about living on an airplane and too much travel. And that's not right for your child. Uh, and it, uh, you, you get these kind of simultaneous equations something is the fundamental constraint. If you go back to old algebra, something's the fundamental constraint. Family should be the constraint. It's more important than your career. Now, your career serves your family, and, and you developing your talents serves your family, all kinds of things, but, but, but that, so, if I had a, if I had a, if I had a, the, the short little, you know, three sentence version of it, I'd have given it to you, but there's no, there's no great easy answer to this one other than keep, keep, pushing that question in front of yourself. Don't, don't let it disappear, because it's a, it's a hard one to balance. It was a hard one for me to balance, I'll say it that way. Anything else for the good of the order? I think you've done a great job, Mark. Thank you very much. All right. issues that, that, that I think your question got at is that all of us are doing the math in our head. <clears throat> we know we ought to spend more time with our wife and children. Right. We also have a desire to be successful. And, they, and, and, and we're afraid that if we actually right. have that centered, we're not going to be as successful <clears throat> as we otherwise could be. Right. My answer to that is that's probably true. I mean, yep, if people that are true. willing to throw their families underneath the bus might actually be right. our boss someday. Right. I comment on that, because you've been at the top of the heap in yeah. most cases. And well, in, in most cases recently. Uh, you know, I, I there's certainly spent a lot of time in places where I had not just a boss. Everybody's got a boss. I've still got a boss, but, you know, you got a, but, you know, seven or eight bosses kind of mm -hmm. stuff. I. I, th I think you, you said it's true. It is true. It simply is true that, that we are all wrestling with this question. And, and particularly, you know, we, we've talked a lot about, you mentioned spouses. Um, I have three daughters. I tell you, the most important thing you can do for your daughter is treat your spouse well. Because there's a lot of knucklehead slash predator types out there. And when your young daughter rises up to have to sort out the, the good from the, the wheat from the chaff, the good from the bad, the predators from the, the non-predators, they've got one place where they got to see what this is actually supposed to be, and that was you. And it was how you treated your spouse. And Nothing is perfect. There's no algorithm that makes life perfectly predictable, but I guarantee you the math will work out better and the odds are much higher for those young daughters of yours if, if they saw you treating your spouse well. So, so I, that's probably one I should have put out here. I also didn't do that as well as I should have now in reflection. 
I was more focused on them sometimes when in fact I would have been more value to them if I'd spent more time focused on my spouse. Uh, and, and same thing if you're raising sons and you don't want your sons to be the predator types, show them. Show them. Don't, you can talk all day. We, you know, we all know you can talk all day long. It's really how you live that's what people are looking at. Turn off the volume, watch people. And they watch, they're watching you. Your kids are watching you all the time. All the time. They were watching us all the time. So, good. Thank you, Mark. Yep. Thank you. Uh, yeah.